Hey, y'all. My name is Susan Sparks, and I'm the senior pastor here at Madison Avenue Baptist Church in New York City. We are a diverse community brought together by faith. We hope that you enjoy our service today. Oh, I woke up this morning with my mind, and it was stayed on Jesus. Woke up this morning with my mind, and it was stayed on Jesus. Woke up this morning with my mind, and it was stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 I'd like to start out this morning with a little confession, a little self-disclosure. At the beginning of the year, I realized that I had been consuming way too many cheeseburgers with mayonnaise and accompanying festive beverages. <laughs> so I decided I needed to scale it back and start taking a little better care of myself. As a part of this grand plan, I joined New York Sports Club right up the street. So I started looking through the available classes, where I could start, and not one class seemed like the appropriate class one would start with after being out of the workout game for a while. I mean, they're all classes with titles like Max Burn, or CrossFit Battle, or my favorite, Booty Buster. Which makes me wonder if anyone has ever said the word booty in this pulpit. I, I, don't, I don't know, and probably they shouldn't, so there it is. Anyway, um, all of these classes were just way too much for my first go-around. So I kept looking, kept looking, and finally I found exactly what I needed. The class was called Prime Time Cardio, and it was listed under the category Senior Adults. <laughs> But I was like, perfect, this is perfect, because I can go to this class and be the most fit person in it, get myself a little, you know, gym confidence back, and then hit the booty blaster and be fine. All good. All good until I go to the gym, me and my smug self, and I showed up, and I walk into the studio, into the primetime cardio studio, and I just sort of froze at the door and went, oh, <laughs> no, no, no. Because there in front of me was an entire room packed full of what I was quite sure were retired rockets. <laughs> Honey, I kid you not, these were super fit, lean, muscular, very tall women, all like 20 years older than me. And if that wasn't enough, in walks the teacher. In walks this woman, probably late 70s, I'm going to guess, that had a body that was a cross between Angela Bassett and Black Panther, Shakira, J-Lo, and Linda Hamilton in Terminator 1 and 2. That club is three blocks from our house, and I had to get an Uber home from that class. Okay? Toby knows this is true. He saw the bill. <laughs> I mean, that said, I've been going ever since. I love this class. I love it. I mean, my new retired Rocket friends are all the visual I need to be inspired to get healthy. I mean, they are the vision, right, of my end game, of what I'm working toward of the purpose I am working for. And every time I start to reach for a medium rare cheeseburger with a little mayo and a festive burger, I see that 70 year old Linda Hamilton looking at me and then I drop and do 10 push-ups on the floor <laughs> at whatever restaurant I find myself in. <laughs> you gotta have a visual. You gotta have a visual. So important in this life to have a clear vision of your end game, where you are going, what you are working toward, the purpose you are working for. It's like my friend Reverend Ken Sahesta once said, you must align your heart's delight with your hand's valor. 
align your heart's delight with your hand's valor. I mean, there's tons of research and writing out there about the psychological power of visualization, how it's used by everybody from Bill Gates to Olympic athletes. Go read that. I'm not going to take time in the sermon to go into that, but read it. It's interesting stuff. The bottom line is you got to have a visual. you got to have a visual. And trust me, if you don't develop that visual, that vision for yourself, the world will do it for you. And then you're in trouble. Because for the rest of your life, you will be caught in confusion and doubt. You will be fighting an internal battle of what your heart tells you versus what this external artificial world vision is telling you. Today is Transfiguration Sunday, as you heard from Heather's scripture reading. And and I read that scripture as a similar story. It's a story about Jesus giving the disciples a visual. Giving the disciples a vision of their end game. A vision of what they were working toward. A vision of the purpose they were working for. And Lord knows, just like us, they needed it. You know, all you have to do is go to the chapter before ours to see it. And by the way, that's not a bad thing to do when you're reading scripture. Just... Go to the chapter before and see what happened right before the story you're reading. Sometimes that can answer a lot of questions for you. For example, we read chapter 17 today. Let's go back to chapter 16. There the disciples were caught in a total fog of confusion and doubt. It's, it's like I like to say, they were like a dog on wet linoleum. You know, honey, they were just all over the place. They were confused, they were unorganized, they weren't hearing anything or understanding anything that Jesus was saying. In that chapter, Jesus has spent the whole day talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were trying their level best to trick Jesus. They were exhausted, or Jesus had to be exhausted, so at the end of the day, they all get in the boat and they take off. And somewhere in there, the disciples realized they forgot to pack bread unrelated to this mistake Jesus says to them he's probably been thinking this over in his mind he says listen up guys seriously you need to be wary of the yeast of the Pharisees meaning the influence of the Pharisees right (laughs) but the disciples in their fog in their confusion and doubt turn to each other and say oh my gosh he's mad we didn't bring the bread Jesus hears this and is like oh my Lord in heaven, you are the most dense people I have ever met in my entire life. I mean, you know he went to sleep that that particular night and said a version of this prayer. Lord in heaven, save me from these people. And if that's not possible, then help me show them the big picture. Help me get them to focus Help me offer them a vision of our end game, of what we're working towards, of what the purposes we're working for. Amen. And sure enough, the scripture tells us that six days later, Jesus knew exactly what he had to do. So he takes James and Peter and John, the ringleaders, and he goes up to a high mountain and, quote, There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and with him appeared Moses and Elijah talking to Jesus. And a bright cloud covered them, and a voice said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen, listen to him. It was this moment where the disciples got their visual. They got their vision of the end game, which was Jesus as God's chosen one. Jesus as God's messenger. Jesus as the connection and healing between heaven and earth. That was what they were working towards. That was the purpose they were working for. That was the visual that would inspire them, support them, and hold them steady through the difficult times to come. Like the disciples, all of us, all of us need a visual, a vision of what's important, our end game, 
something that will lead us and support us and, and hold us steady in those difficult times. I, I saw a great illustration of this in a movie. I've seen the movie. I think Toby and I have both seen the movie like a trillion times. You probably have too. The movie Apollo 13. Has anybody, have y'all seen that movie? Well, okay, if you haven't, you should see it. Start with one and you'll get to a trillion because you'll love it. But there's a scene where the astronauts are taking refuge in the lunar module because there was an explosion in the service module and all of their oxygen is basically gone. And so there's this point where their survival, the odds of their survival are slim to none. And in this moment, the commander, Jim Lovell, has a flashback. And he remembers when he was a fighter pilot over the, over the Pacific Ocean and his instrument panel failed. He couldn't see the altitude. He couldn't see the direction. He could see nothing. He had no idea where he was. He had no idea where the aircraft carrier was. He had no idea where he was going to land. And after a few minutes of panic, his eyes began to adjust to the darkness. And out in the ocean, he saw a subtle green glow. And it was made by a trail of millions of tiny dinoflagellates. There it is. I knew you wondered where it was coming. <laughs> Told you. Which are little microscopic algae. And these, this algae wards off predators by glowing when it's disturbed or touched or moved. And like ancient sailors for centuries before, Lovell knew about this phenomena. He also knew that that green trail was so big that it could only have been made by one thing, the propeller of a giant ship, that aircraft carrier. So he used that trail to find the aircraft carrier to land. He used it to find his end game. He used it as a visual to bring him home. This is Ash Wednesday, or the week of Ash Wednesday, when we mark the beginning of Lent. The journey to prepare us for Easter week and Holy Week, and you know, many people give up things for Lent, maybe alcohol or chocolate or fatty food. I don't know what else there is. I mean, there... That's all there is, um, but <laughs> this year, <laughs> I'm going to try, personally, I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to do a Lenten craft project. It's going to be a macrame wall hanging. Um, I'm just kidding. I'm not doing a macrame. <laughs> Stay with me. Um, no, what I'm going to do is use the 40 days or so of Lent to create what I hope will become my transfiguration visual the vision of what is important to me, to my end game, of where I'm headed. And I invite you to consider doing the same. Now, you may not want to do exactly this as I explain it, but whatever you do, do something intentionally, daily, during this period to ground yourself in what that visual might be. But here's how I'm going to do it. Every day, starting on Wednesday, I'm going to start with a simple prayer. And I love what Heather said in the prayer today. It was so perfect. God, I'm here. Reveal yourself. Keep talking. That's it. Just something that simple. And make an intention in your mind that you're listening. And then you go throughout your day and you wait for that vision to come. Because it will. Somewhere in your day, because you planted that intention, a vision, an image will come to you. And it could be anything, but that is going to be a visual that would make your heart happy, an image, a thing that puts your soul at peace. Our Richard Bender is going to sing a beautiful anthem in a minute, and the lyrics say, what can, make my, what can make me whole in my soul? What can make me whole in my soul? Every day we will watch for whatever image that is. Maybe it's a song or a photo or maybe it's a project you're working on at work that makes your heart jump. Maybe it's a client, a type of interaction that you're in the middle of that makes your heart happy or maybe it's an article in the paper that pulls at your heartstrings. Whatever it is, find it and then record it. Now, maybe you take a picture of it. Maybe you take a screenshot or maybe you do it old school. You cut it out with scissors. <laughs> but you 
keep a list or you post it on a Pinterest board or you post it on a piece of paper and you collect these every day through Advent. And why? Because by the time you get to Easter, you are going to have a powerful, powerful collection of visuals. Visuals of what it means to serve your risen Christ in your life. Not the world's vision, your vision. Your vision of serving a risen Christ. A vision that will lead you and support you and hold you steady through the difficult times. You got to have a visual. I mean, Lord knows in this world, this time, <laughs> this place, where all we're fed is negative images and ideas and things that corrode our heart, we have to preempt the world's poison by creating our own visual of what could be, what should be, what will be. Hey, listen, if it works for transforming a sedentary pastor into Linda Hamilton, what more power will it have when we invite God into the planning? I want to leave you this morning with a prayer, a prayer by my friend Reverend Ken Sahesta that I mentioned earlier, and this prayer offers what I think are really powerful, inspirational words to get our hearts set to enter into this season of Lent. Let us pray. Hold fast to the one who made you. Stand with the beloved, and your footing shall be firm. Rest in the merciful one, and you shall be buoyed. Be clear about what you seek and where you seek for the beatific life cannot be found in the land of illusion. But do not despair, for life is stirring in cracks and clefts and barren terrain. Train your eyes to see through the tangle of disordered desire. Resist even to death that which bedevils the common good. Welcome and foster all that shields the battered, that restores harrowed fields and forests, that reclaims despoiled waters and all creatures great and small. In these lie your spiritual duty, the performance of your praise, and the practice of your baptismal vows. By such does your heart's delight Align with your hands' valor. Thereby you shall go out in peace and be led back in joy. The hills bursting in song, the trees in applause, and the people said.
Thanks for joining us. Madison Avenue Baptist Church is located at 31st and Madison Avenue in New York City. Our website is www.mabcnyc.org.